I'm very excited tonight to welcome Dorothy R. Santos to the studio. Um, tonight begins their artist residency here in the studio, which is supported by the Steiner Lecture Series. While they're here, um, Dorothy will co-host a workshop at Kelly Strayhorn's Alloy Studios, um, co-sponsored by Duolingo, on March 11th, along with local artist who's also here, Adrian Jones. And tomorrow, we invite those of you who want to come back here um, for a pizza filled meet and greet at noon um, and from noon to 1.30 so you can chat with Dorothy in a much more casual setting and also eat pizza. Um, and we'll have a gluten free option I believe too. So welcoming pizza, but all dairy. Um, <laughs> you know, it's an imperfect treat. Uh, <laughs> But also to continue, uh, Dorothy is a friend, colleague, and collaborator for more, many here in Pittsburgh, despite living in the Bay Area. Um, that's because Dorothy is an abundant and generous artist and scholar whose scholarship and work is a wonderful demonstration of value-driven curiosity and critical engagement in their many communities and interests. To offer those of you who are not yet familiar with Dorothy's work, I'm going to literally read their bio right now, just so you have a primer and then they're gonna talk about more. <laughs> um, Dorothy R. Santos, who uses she or they pronouns, is a Filipino-American storyteller, poet, artist, and scholar whose academic and research interests include feminist media histories, critical me medical anthropology, computational media, technology, race, and ethics. She is a PhD candidate in, in film and digital media at the University of California, Santa Cruz as a Eugene V. Cota Robles Fellow. She received her master's degree in visual and critical studies at the California College of the Arts and holds bachelor's degrees in philosophy and psychology from the University of San Francisco. Interdisciplinary. <laughs> um, her work has been exhibited at Ars Electronica, Rewire Festival, Fort Mason Center for Arts and Culture, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, and the GLBT Historical Society. Her writings, writing appears in Art 21, Art in America, Ars Technica, Hyperallergic, Rhizome, Slate, and Vice Motherboard. Her essay, Materiality to Machines, Manufacturing the Organic and Hypotheses for Future Imaginings, was published in the Routledge Companion to Biology and Art and Architecture. She is a co-founder of Refresh, a politically engaged art and curatorial collective, and serves as the executive director for the Processing Foundation. In 2022, she received the Mozilla Creative Media Art for Media Award for her inter interactive docu-poetics work, The Cyborg's Prosody. Docu-poetics po is the theme of the workshop at Kelly Strayhorn. I suggest you grab your ticket soon. It's filling up. Um, and she serves as an advisory board member for Power Plant um, Slash Arts and House of Algeria. So with no further ado, please help me in welcoming Dorothy. Thank you. It's always so weird to hear um, my bio because I, I teased my mom when I was in high school. I tease her now because I wanted to go to art school and she's like, no, no way, you're not doing that. And I was like, okay, might as well study psychology. Oh, I want to double major in philosophy. And then here I am now and I always tell her, you should have just sent me to art school. <laughs> So yeah, who am I? Um, aside from being a PhD candidate, I also wanted to just say, I'm really driven by games. I love games, and I love making everything into a game, even if it's a sad emo game, uh, which is some of my work, actually. But it helps me process because it helps me think a little bit more speculatively about not just future, um, not just the future, but also what world building can look like. Um, I also. I'm a tarot reader. I've been a tarot reader since I was a teenager, so that's like 20, 20 years. Um, I, I know I look a little young. I tell people that, and they're just like, wait, how old are you? But, um, but yeah, that's something that's really huge in my life, like cartomancy and bibliomancy. I love, like, chance operations. So every talk I give, I, I usually title, and so I, I titled this Infrastructure of Feeling. Don't worry, we're not going to, you know, um, get into our feelings and emotions. There's a real actual, this is an actual term that I'll um, explain, but I do have a thought experiment, the first one for you today, which is, what is emergency media? 
what is emergency media? You know, what, what do you think the aforementioned phrase means? What are some of the images, sounds, and ideas that come to mind? We can, you know, it could be, you could, two people, we don't need to prolong, but I just want a couple of examples. The first thing that pops in my mind is the, like, the emergency announcing system or something, the emergency alert system uh, that does that really annoying boo, and then it tells you whatever it is. This is a test usually. If there's a real emergency, this is where we'd be telling you. That, that's, so, that's great. I haven't actually heard someone say that, but absolutely. How about another one? Um, I guess when I hear this phrase, I think about like media that you'd like consume in an emergency. And so I feel like for me, that's actually a lot of stuff that's like where the opposite of an emergency is happening, where it's like really calm and nice and like, you know, makes you feel good so that when you're like going through a situation, there's like something that you're holding on to. That, yeah, wow, that's another good, that's another great example. So I also wanted to, sh oh, please feel free to share. <laughs> I just have an offering. Um, I think of podiums actually, and like stand, like there's always like the press conference, and they make it live, but no one's at it, at it yet to like tell you what's happening. And there's often like a minute or two of just a podium of some sort, and that I think of as emergency. I'm like, oh no, what happened? Is that empty space? Oh, that's fantastic. I actually have never thought about that. I think we could be here for quite some time doing this. So I'll stop, but another reason why I wanted everyone to engage in this thought experiment is I'm gonna be talking about uh, infrastructure of feeling in two different key areas that are part of my research. I wish I could talk about um, my dissertation research kind of in, it, in its entirety, but I know that we're limited in time and my, um, my desire is actually to be in conversation with you all. But the reason why I ask about this is because one of the things that I am researching is emergency infrastructures in addition to call center agents. So what does that entail? So uh, telecommunicators that uh, have been trained as telephone operators. So I look at a lot of feminist media histories because that's very gendered labor. But I also look at how 911 dispatchers, call center agents are trained, um, nurse triaging, uh, and also con what is it? Um, disease investigators or contact tracers. So during the pandemic, how are people trained? I was actually trained as a contact or um, as a contact tracer or a disease investigator. We could talk a little bit more about that. But some of my research questions are actually informed by the different types of media that each of you that shared, um, you know, uh, like those are great examples of like what my research questions actually look at. So how does a human voice mediate care and authority within an emergency infrastructure, but also how might we think about the relationships between voice recognition softwares and machine learning within these particular infrastructures. One of the scholars that I cite pretty heavily in my dissertation and in my research is actually Elizabeth Elsesser. Uh, she wrote the book In Case of Emergency, How Technologies Mediate Crisis and Normalize Inequality. One of the things that really resonated with me, and it, I keep coming back to this, is that emergency is located in the present tense. When she said that, I couldn't help but continue thinking about that. You know, it's in the present tense because when you think about an emergency that has passed, there's usually media that follows that, right? So um, there's something that, you know, uh, has happened already. It's in, it's in the past. It's like you there's there's some lessons learned. There's a reason why a particular system is put in place because an emergency has happened. But then also it's not really located in the future either. Because when you think about, you, you can never anticipate an emergency. You know, um, <laughs> I think we also live in a culture um, and I focus mostly on American emergency infrastructures in the, in the future. I actually want to look at other emergency infrastructures in other countries. But this is something that really deeply resonated because you know, when we think about that, um, this, this kind of infrastructure of feeling, you know, Elsesser actually talks about it as a material or representational instantiation of particular ideological and felt elements of society. Now, I agree with that, totally. I think the material and the representational instantiation part is pretty obvious. It's actually the examples that you all gave. Even the empty podium, when you see that, that's, that's recorded, that's documented. That in and of itself is, can be 
a type of instantiation of emergency. But the ideological and the felt elements of society, that's a little bit trickier. Because when we think of emergency, especially in this country, for whom? For whom is um, the support being given? Um, and, for, and who is training to support different communities? And so as a film and digital media person, I obviously look at format and uh, different types of media formats. I, I obviously have it in um, like parent, parent, the A and T at, uh, in parentheticals because I, look at, I also see them as forms. So predominantly, I look at media depictions um, of 911 uh, dispatchers or telecommunicators. I also look at advertisements of, uh, of assistive tech, wearable tech. I look at emergency dispatcher training materials, so videos, still images, and I'll share this. I actually took a 911 dispatcher training uh, for New York-based. Um, they actually give free trainings to New York um, uh, res or, sorry, New York 911 dispatchers, and I actually signed up for it. I was the only non 911 dispatcher participant, and it was very illuminating. Eight hours, okay. Um, a 30-minute lunch break and two breaks that were five minutes and every single minute the teacher the facilitator had something to say and she kept saying there's even more than this but I can only teach you this much so that should tell you how our 911 dispatchers well in the New York State what they have to go through they already have to take time out of their schedules to do this training but not only that Something, there were so many things I gleaned, and I, I want to touch upon that point, or I want, I'm sticking to this point really quickly because um, they don't know things, they're not trained about cultural sensitivity, they're not trained about um, competency, like cultural competency. Uh, I think another thing is they're not trained on pronouns, like little simple things that might be, um, that could save someone's life. And it's not, the, it's not the dispatcher's fault, but that is a type of infrastructure I've been looking at because this all relates to abolition as well. And then the fourth thing is dispatcher narratives and commentary. One of the things I realized when I was reading a lot of um, these oral histories of 911 dispatchers is there is such a high uh, rate of um, ideation because your entire day is spent on, you're high on adrenaline. There's no break for you. This is actually, they are called the first first responders. And so there's a particular way that they're trained, even their voice to sound. And here's an example. 911, what's your emergency? I have been in a car accident. My car slips. There's water getting the car and I can't get out. 911, what is your emergency? I came on paddle boarding and a hard wind is pushing me out to sea. Okay, do not hang up. 911, what's your emergency? I'm here as a farm. I broke my leg. Straight down 21 feet. I sure am. I sure need help quick. Are you by yourself? Yes. Have you tried to get out? Have you tried to bust the window or something? I'm pretty far out in the ocean. I can't get to my cell phone. I'm talking on my Apple Watch. Try to keep talking to me. Okay. I can't fight the wind anymore. It's getting deeper. Can you come in next? Please hurry. I'm hurting real bad. You're going to seek help, okay? I see them. They're opening the door. Hold on, hold on. Are you in an air pocket? Um, I'm just at the driver's seat. Okay, so your head is above water? Yes, sir. And pardon me, I should have actually given a content warning that it describes, you know, physical injury or at least edited to um, eliminate as much of that. But the reason why I wanted to share it is because this is also kind of my job as a media scholar, looking at media. Why does it matter? I think a lot of people might ask, why are you looking at commercials? Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> Who cares because people are then told that you need to have something that's, you know, hundreds if not a thousand dollars to, to survive. And I think some of the observations that I've noticed, not just in Apple commercials, um, are the sensations that you feel. Actually, I'm a, I'm a huge crier. I'm very, talk about infrastructure feeling. <laughs> I, I remember the first time I actually watched this, um, they, you know, and this is actually not on Apple's um, YouTube account anymore. It was taken down. So other, this, that's actually from another account. Um, you know, there was a lot of, I guess, uh, pushback. Um, you know, clearly the company gained consent because um, a lot of media is actually made public. Um, why? Why do you think, oh, this is another. Why do you think 
um, 911 emergency media in this case is made public. Can someone tell me why they think that? Why, why, would, why would it, yeah, why would it be available? I'm, I'm reaching here, but to model responses? To moderate responses? To, to model responses, to model. so that you know what to say when, when you call. That is actually a good, that's great. Um, thank you for sharing that because that is a part of it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, because, yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about that. You, you went down a different direction. That's not reaching. No, not at all. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it's for legal purposes so that it's, you know, it, it can actually be used in a court of law. And some of the other observations I had, um, moving image, slow, dystopian, drone technology that's actually capturing this bucolic kind of um, foreboding though. You know, it's not, it's, not, it's not a totally pristine day in any of the scenes that you saw. The soundscape again is I'm going a little bit out of order because the, the use of text is also something I wanted to kind of point out last. It was made and edited to look like speech to text. So those are some of the things that I want people to like think about when they look at media. That you're, you know, Apple, that's, that's 60 seconds. So think about that. That's 60 seconds to capture not just your emotion, not just the state that you would be in, but it, it forces you to think really deeply about your own experiences of crisis. And so some of the considerations before I go into um, some of my artwork <laughs> um, and, and kind of how it's been influenced, but some of the considerations I, I, I want folks to think about, not just this Apple commercial, by the way, but I want people to think about voice and speech and utterances or paralinguistic cues. Now, paralinguistic cues are um, that. That's a paralinguistic cue because I'm thinking, and that's very common in American speech, right? So another paralinguistic cue is someone saying like or hmm. You know, there's things that we, you know, um, voice and, or speech acts are not iterable. You can't control Z on them. But, you know, there's also a difference between utterances. Utterances are, you know, sounds, um, sometimes baby gibberish. Uh, voice is, okay, it's audible. There's some kind of um, discernible quality of a voice speaking. And then speech or speech acts is semantics. You actually are threading words and phrases and sentences together to actually convey a meaning. But then I also think about real emergency media. You know, how might we think differently about the depictions of emergency infrastructures within media? I included this as a consideration because I actually interviewed uh, Justin Wong. Uh, he's a supervisor at the San Francisco Department of Emergency Management. And we had such a fantastic conversation, but one of the things I asked him was, if you could tell people anything about 911 dispatching that they should know, what, what, would it, what would it be? If you could just, just loudspeaker, tell the community, if you could speak to every you know, citizen in, in San Francisco. And he said, uh, please don't pay attention to what you see in the media. The number one question that we get when people are in crises that are often asked to our dispatchers is, why are you asking me so many questions? Just send me help. And then um, he says, uh, but the media has actually ingrained that in different communities, but more specifically, people have that expectation that we have all, that the, op the dispatchers and the emergency centers have all this technology. You have, you know, geolocating. It's like, just send me help. Why do I need to tell you all this? Again, it goes back to the production of media and what can be documented. Where are you? What's your emergency? What's your name? Where's your address? Is this person breathing? Can they walk? That person is also, so now you can see why a dispatcher is like just high adrenaline because they have to treat each call, even if it's someone suffering you know, a heart attack or whether it's someone whose cat is stuck in a tree, they actually have to treat every call as an actual emergency. And another consideration is assistive tech. So voice recognition, relay operation um, or operators uh, for individuals that are hard of hearing or deaf uh, persons. And the reason why I included this is because, um, I, I, don't, I didn't catch your name, but <laughs> the gentleman in the front here, where you, you talked about modeling voice. The reason why I talk about, and I'm interested in voice tech um, related to assistive tech, but also to 911 dispatching is, uh, speech to text is actually being used in some emergency um, centers. And uh, a lot of that is for 
the actual dispatchers because a lot of them suffer suffer, suffer from excuse me I can't talk suffer from um, carpal tunnel or RSI because they actually have to type everything out that they hear that's why sometimes if you hear recordings they'll say they'll ask the person to repeat because they have to take it down um, for documentation purposes so again I believe um, in Southern California there's actually some emergency centers that are actually already using that to assist their um, dispatchers and then the fourth consideration that you know I look at within my dissertation and just even in my creative practices like abolition how might we think about the future design of socially just platforms that incorporate an abolitionist framework because I think a lot of people you know you you, you can <laughs> how do I say this um, I, I'm very much an abolitionist myself but at the same time how can that happen when all of these uh, systems uh, rely on other actual agencies. How do we work within that? How do we start to envision something different? Um, I think with that is also, it kind of goes into the, the work that I'm gonna be talking about in the second half of my uh, talk, which is actually focused on you know um, accent bias and accent elimination. But there's so much work to do. And I kind of, it's kind of strange because it's like, I kind of feel like, what is it, Frank Ocean's Pyramid song, where it's like two songs in one? Anyway, whatever, you gotta listen to that song. That song is so good, but anyway. Um, cause, cause the second half of my talk is gonna be like, wait, this is, sounds so different. And, um, but, and it feels a little different, but it's connected. But I wanted to share um, an academic article. Um, it's actually a good one. I, I actually recommend reading it. <laughs> but it's by uh, John Robinson, Jim Maddock, and Kate Starbird. And Kate Starbird is actually known for a lot of their uh, research in uh, emergency infrastructures. But the, the title of the piece is um, Examining the Role of Human and Technical Infrastructure During Emergency Response. And this is one of the things that stood out to me. Human in interoperability interoperability involves a person actively facilitating communication with an awareness and understanding of cultural differences and technical limitations of the receiving party. This work involves seeking, filtering, managing, and translating information so it can pass across the inherent gaps that exist between responders, between organizations, and between response organization and their publics. And so again, a lot of this work that I've been thinking about is how do people say things from where they're at and how then do you meet them uh, where you're at? And so I was asked recently, well, not so recent. <laughs> I was asked last year to um, delve into the archives at San Jose State University, where I'm an artist and researcher, along with Bay Area-based artist Sofia Cordova. And we have an upcoming show that is called Hidden in Plain Sight. And we were asked to pick a thing, an artifact, um, or artifacts in the collection. And so I actually looked at the Indian Oral History Project that was done, oh gosh, I think probably well over a decade, and I found the oral history of Andy uh, Khanna, who was a teacher or a professor in engineering there, and he talked about a lot of his experiences, you know, when he came to, the, when he immigrated to the United States, but also what it felt like to be at the cusp of like the computer age, like the dawn of the computer age and personal computing and, and all of that. And so. Um, what I did, and I call it a speculative relay or creative nonfiction, and I can, you know, I don't need to, I can talk over this because there's no sound. But um, the blue text is me, and the red text is um, Andy, also known, his real name is Nand Khanna. But what I did was I read the 70 page um, transcript, uh, I read it a few times. And I pulled out, uh, this is a creative prompt for me, and we could talk about this, because this is typically how I work. But what I did was I, um, I pulled out phrases that I felt my mom would say. Because I kind of thought, well, what would, you know, they're very different, but they both are, you know, immigrated, and they were of a professional class. Because my mom, you know, even though she started off as a clerk, opening letters, you know, in a basement of a bank, <laughs> you know, there were these kind of aspirational kind of things that they both wanted. And so <laughs> I took this one in particular because you'll see there's faded text. So, and it's called a relay because I, I use the form and format of relay operators. Relay operators are actually, 
are actually supposed to just relay a message. Again, typically um, a hard of hearing or a deaf person would actually use a relay, operate, um, a relay operating system or platform. Um, another type of community member that might use it is someone who maybe experiences, a, has, has um, aphasia, so they cannot actually uh, speak, engage in speech acts because it sounds like warbled, like almost like warbled speech, but then they're still able to like type and so can have conversations that way. And the reason why I use this as a creative prompt for myself is I really love constraints. I love to be able to give myself a challenge and then re, re kind of recast myself. So what I did for uh, this particular media artifact is I recast myself as the interviewer because I didn't actually like the questions that, that, that Andy Kana was asked. And um, I was disappointed, you know? And what happens when we dig into an archive and we realize, oh, I, I don't really like what's being said here. But you can't change it. Why? Because it's part of an archive. That's not your job. But if you engage in kind of a speculative um, way of uh, having a relationship with the archive, it could be so rich. And that's what I actually found. But the reason why I did a screenshot of this is because he talks about no Nolan Bushnell. And he says, he was a genius. Like he said it with that affect in the oral history video. And I was like, no, nah. <laughs> I'm sorry. And then I, and I actually wrote the text out like, you know what, I would, and I actually read this aloud and I included if like a relay were involved. And of course the conversation is a lot longer, but it forced me to slow down. I also had to change what I was writing, almost like sometimes make it clipped. So it's, a, it's one of these exercises. Again, I'm co-facilitating with Adrian and you know, how do we work with docu-poetics as a modality? So this is one of the ways I do it. But yeah, I can read this. I would, you know, he says, Andy Connor says, he was a genius. I would respectfully disagree with you regarding him being a genius. He had some great ideas, but after seeing him give talk, uh, a talk years ago, well, he's not very wise sounding to me. Anyway, I was intrigued by a GPS navigation project you worked on years ago, et cetera, et cetera. And I also add this because he talks about voice recognition being used. Um, and another aspect of it was, uh, which he was really proud of, was that Bill Gates was one of the first people to test it in his own car. So, another thought experiment. This time, no one has to answer, because my thought experiment is: think of a time when you were told, "Watch your tone." So I'll make myself <laughs> vulnerable and say, I heard that quite a bit, you know, from my mom to exes. That's why they're exes. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> No, but seriously, you know, uh, you know how, how did it make you feel? Um, what are some of the thoughts running through your mind regarding tone, um, regarding this time or this memory about your tone? But I say this because the next piece I'm going to show you is Cyborg's Prosody, which is uh, I was generously supported by Mozilla uh, to, to make this work. And the media format, forms and formats I looked at were Amazon Halo. I also looked at Sonus AI. Um, I, I'm very curious how many just you know, can raise your hand. How many people are familiar with Amazon Halo and or Sonus AI? Okay, so that, okay. I, it, it, I'm actually really grateful for that. I, and I say that because um, I'll talk a little bit about the Amazon Halo in a, in a second, but I just, that's, that's actually, that's good. Um, you know, uh, and I'll explain why. But uh, the other type of media form and format that I look at, look at is DIY educational material. Um, you know, I, one aspect of my research is looking at accent elimination and accent bias, um, predominantly in Filipino call centers and how Filipino um, folks are trained to serve the Western world. And I also look at the ethnographic research of Filipino call centers by scholar Jan M. Padillos, um, really brilliant scholar that actually did a lot, I mean, very immersive experience. Like she actually, I mean, I've done this as well. I mean, I, you know, I, I took the 911 dispatcher training on disability awareness. I, I've done contact tracing training. Jan and Padillos actually applied, got in, and uh, as a as a call center agent in the Philippines at Vox Elite, which is a, um, you know, um, a company that actually you know serves the the Western kind of conglomerate world, like conglomerate companies, and um, actually worked to to be, you know, a, a call center agent, but the the interesting aspect of it was her relationship with other trainees because she so audibly had an American accent. 
So that was really, um, her, books is, her book is, uh, is fantastic. It's called A Nation on the Line. And then I also looked at interviews and um, oral histories as well. So my research in with the Amazon Halo, I actually wore this for 60 days straight. And um, it basically, I'm, I don't think it's popular anymore. I think Amazon lost a lot of money trying, trying to develop this technology, but it was a wellness band. And so what it would do is it would actually, the primary function of it besides, you know, it could kind of capture the steps you were taking, heart rate, et cetera, but the, the primary use of it was actually to track the prosody or the tone or animation of your voice. That's what prosody is. And so I wore this for 60 days straight. I set it up. And as you can see, you know, it asks you very Western canonical text, speak in your natural voice. I'm like, I, I have 20. So I'm not sure which natural voice you want me to, to, to do, but whatever, we'll do it. Um, and I did this in preparation for my qualifying exams because I wanted to present this work to my committee. And it was interesting because um, these are kind of three snapshots of conversations I had. And I was like, oh, I forgot you know, which one you know, I had with which committee member. But I said, no, absolutely not the first one. No, never unconfident or uncomfortable or hesitant with any committee member or mentor. But um, this is kind of what it looked like. And again, the Amazon Halo would not, it doesn't always capture. You actually have to set the app, um, you have to set it to live on the app um, in order for it to kind of capture uh, your prosody or conversation. So another form or format that I looked at is like DIY media. So again, Rhea Ninja, she's a very popular YouTuber, YouTuber, uh, entrepreneur, that's what folks have called her. But the reason why I looked at a lot of her videos and um, you know her social media kind of posts is she serves this really kind of interesting um, community, not just the Filipinos, but anyone that has what is called a non-dominant Western accent or voice or a language. And so she gets so many people, not just from the Philippines, actually commenting on her, her work or trying to get her to do tutorials on how to practice speaking uh, with an American accent. It's, um, it's it, I have this very contentious relationship with it, but you know, again, this is a part of what the work is all about. So I think I'm gonna, try and play something. So this is Sonus AI. This is their demo. Hi, this is Alex from the customer service aid. How are you today? So this is with, with, Great without, to hear. without I'm Sonus. I'm doing very well. Thank you very much for asking. So this how is, can I help you today? This is when you use Sonus. I'm so sorry about that. I'll be glad to help you. Can I get your full this name, is a, phone number, a software and that's built in that order? for instant do you happen Real to have time order number so I can bring accent up your elimination. Order? Thank you. Let me check on the status of your order. Please give me a minute to check on that. Thank you for waiting. It looks like your order shipped to the wrong address. I'm so sorry about the mix up. I think one of the things that I wanted folks to understand is they use the word magic, which is horrific. Um, but the reason why I say that is you know, there was um, a media scholar. Uh, oh, let me actually go back. There was a media scholar, uh, Carolyn Marvin. I'm not sure how many of you have, have heard of Carolyn Marvin, but she wrote the book, uh, When Old Media is New. And there's this one chapter that she has on how engineering, um, that there is actually a long line of tech bros, you know, what would be considered tech bros, and this kind of expertise um, this gatekeeping of knowledge, and how a lot of these technologies, electricity, what have you, telecommunications, a lot of, um, you know, definitely indigenous communities, um, black, brown folks, you know, at the turn of the 18th century were always tricked into using different types of technology, believing that it was magic. So this is just a recapitulation of the past. So for Cyborg's Prosody, um, it's a playable media, sound-based, voice-generated work. That's a mouthful. But um, I just like calling it, it's a game. <laughs> but um, the point of the game, and these are some mock-ups. Um, 
But essentially, it's an intervention. It's this kind of response to accent reduction schools that so many Filipino and Indian uh, community members here and you know abroad have actually been either felt forced or compelled to take on this labor of learning another um, way of speaking. And so I wanted to create instead of an accent reduction school, you know, I wanted to, and this isn't new, you know, I, I wanted to create an accent induction school. And a lot of that, what do you do? You, you, you use Babel, you use Memrise, you use Duolingo, um, which I hope they don't even have Tagalog. I'm going to talk to them about that. But yeah, anyway, I say that because I wanted to kind of take the research that I had done with Amazon Halo and other, you know, other companies, uh, language learning apps that I've, I've taken on to, as, as a kind of focus for these different media formats that I work with and kind of borrow like, okay, well, if you're having folks authenticate their voice, why not, why not do that for cyborgs prosody? And so this last, so like speaking, you know, having a simulation of, well, you, I want you to naturalize your voice, speak in your natural tone or voice or prosody. And then the last um, mock-up here, it's actually a quote from Kathy Park Hong from her book, Minor Feelings, which I actually have a mic to drop, but I won't drop it. Um, it just always deeply resonates with me. Bad English is my heritage. I share a literary lineage with writers who make the unmastering of English their rallying cry, who queer it, twerk it, hack it, calvinize it, other it by hijacking English and warping it into a fugitive tongue. To other English is to make audible the imperial power sewn into the language to slit English open so its dark history slide out. And so a part of me wanted to develop, and you can kind of see, like, I kind of did some patchwork with the presentation because um, there's, like, animations that I thought I got rid of. <laughs> but I will say that the second kind of set of um, mock-ups shows what I want level one, three, and five to look like. Um, and I'll, I'll actually show you the work in progress, but these are a second set that I wanted people to kind of get a visual feeling for what I wanted the game to be like. So as you can see, Tagalog slowly makes its way into the vignettes that I've written. These are five levels, so um, <laughs> they're, they're based on Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's, and this, this project became really personal very fast. Um, originally, I wanted it to be kind of a satire or a parody of these trainings that individuals um, would do and it was also very deeply inspired by Rachel Cruz who is a California based artist uh, she has this poem and you have to hear you have to listen to the recitation of the poem the poem is actually called graduate um, it's called accent reduction school graduate because it's a poem about her father who wanted to and eventually anglicized his name and went to accent reduction school um, when he was when he immigrated to Southern California and it's just, it's so potent. But that was one of the things that really served as an impetus and an inspiration for this work. And so, um, but the thing is, when you go through the game, certain, certain words are in bold and you actually have to repeat the words in order to advance in the game. So you can't actually listen to the vignette or to the story that's being told to you in each level unless you mimic the cyborg's prosody. Um, in this case, uh, the voice is actually, it's my mom. Um, I wasn't actually gonna do that. I was gonna kind of, you know, use some, you know, um, anonymous Filipino uh, accent that was kind of created by, you know, so many of these studios exist now, like Koki is one that I've been or experimenting with. But there was something after conversations with my mentors and conversations with um, my partner, with friends, collaborators, they're just like, why don't you just use your mom's voice? These stories are about her. And that's another form and format of docu-poetics. So I wanted to show level one. So um, the first level is denial. And again, I based all of the, these vignettes off of interviews with my mom. So I asked her very specific questions about each level or stage of grief related to her loss of mother tongue, which is Tagalog. And the first one is yellow sharp points. And you can see here, and then the brilliant artist, uh, Brooklyn-based artist, Christina Dak and I um, did the illustration work. And um, so many people have like, I've gotten such a great response that I'm actually, um, 
I, I found a small press publisher who's actually going to make it into a book and it will include um, the full English translations and then the experience of the game, but without actually like, you know, without the kind of like digital components of it. But as you can see here, uh, you would have to repeat that in order to advance. So then it says, you sacrifice comfort for red, white and blue, you strip the yellow sharp points of the sun away, bidding it farewell. And obviously, you know, I have other mock-ups if, if folks are interested, I'm more than willing to, to share that, but it's, 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 it's in the works. And um, I wanted to read um, an excerpt and then we can talk. There's so many things to talk about. Um, I hope you want to talk, <laughs> but um, this is from uh, level one from Yellow Sharp Points. You learn American English and it's different from Filipino English. You feel the waste of time eroding your memory bank from your lips to your throat to your cerebrum. You will stop speaking your mother tongue. You will stop speaking Tagalog. You will practice. You will say A-E-I-O-U. You can't survive here. You can't be here. You don't talk like us. I'm getting emotional reading this. I've never actually done that. That's never really happened. You will find a job where you don't speak and your hands are riddled with paper cuts. Your mouth is forced to speak vernacular words through more error than trial. So I guess now I'm almost done, but um, another reason why I guess I want folks to really pay attention to the different types of technologies being used in voice recognition, speech technologies, and assistive tech is this is the future that people envision, like a Sonus AI or an Amazon Halo where your speech is and your tone and how you talk are, are tracked, that, it, you know, that there's something that slowly starts to erode how we express ourselves um, that I want, I want people to think about. And I also, I, I was very much inspired by Claudia Rankine's Citizen, so like the use of second person perspective. So all of the vignettes are actually you because you actually have to talk back to my mom. You have to tell her she can't stay here. And I think a lot of people are like, but that's, and if you could believe it, actually, I'm gonna just say this out, out the gate and up front. Um, a lot of people have asked me uh, very difficult questions like, don't you think this is racist? Don't you think it's culturally appropriative? You're born and raised, you know, I'm, you know you're born and raised in San Francisco, California. This is your mom, it's her salud. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the other things where people will say, you know, well, how is this new? What are you doing with technology that, you know, like, and I am working with machine learning um, in phase two of Cyborg's Prosody. Um, but I say, you know, well, how do you learn language? You mimic, you listen to your environment, you listen to those paralinguistic cues. Um, I think it's also an homage to what my mom experienced. And, you know, she said, I know you're gonna write or make artwork about me, but please don't use my name. And I said, okay, I think I can talk poetically about you though, because you, you deserve that. But um, you know, this is this is a very vulnerable work. It's not easy to make, and I know some people have actually expressed that discomfort. But for me, comfort's not the goal. So, thank you so much. <laughs>